Well, turn with me to Job chapter 2, and uh, we'll read the opening verse together. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, you'll remember in our first lesson, back in chapter 1, that in the first instance, Satan came uh, into God's presence, back there in chapter 1 and verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And at the end of the first chapter, Satan had been given a permission uh, to bring devastation into the life of Job, into his family, uh, the loss of his ten children, and the loss of uh, everything that Job had in terms of wealth. And uh, Job's wealth was in terms of uh, camels and sheep and so on. Uh, he was a wealthy man. But now in chapter 2, uh, well, a boundary had been set in chapter 1. He may touch all that Job has, but he wasn't allowed to touch Job himself. Satan had made the accusation, does God, verse 9 of chapter 1, does, God fear, does Job fear God for no reason? Does Job fear God for no reason? The only reason why Job fears God is because life is good. He has everything. Life is, is easy for Job. He has a good lifestyle. But take that away, and he will curse God to his face. Well, Job did not do that. And in chapter 1 and verse 21, he had responded, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, Satan is brought before God once again. God introduces him as a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Verse 3, without reason. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? It's the Hebrew word hinnom. It's as though God is saying to Satan, you incited me to do something to my servant Job when there was no reason, when there was no cause. It might create in us a sense that life is unfair, that life is, well, random. If God himself does things when there's no reason for it, there's no cause for it, there's seemingly no justification for it. Well, at least it looks like that. It, it, it looks like that to Satan. It sometimes looks like that to us. God does things in his providence, in his decree. He permits things to happen. And there seems to be no reason for it. There seems to be no cause for it. I was experiencing some difficulty uh, some 20 years ago. And uh, it was a personal family issue. And I remember confiding in a dear friend of mine. I was an Old Testament professor. And uh, only Old Testament professors would uh, write notes like this. And uh, he says, I have pretty much given up trying to read Providence. But I wonder if you are having one of those Hinnom trials. I had to go and look up what the word Hinnom meant. I realized it was a Hebrew word and realized that he, he was quoting from chapter 2 of the book of Job. Uh, that, that God appears to us sometimes to, to do things without reason without cause, without evident justification that, that we can fathom. Uh, think of Alfred Lord Tennyson's um, Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, this is an account, of course, of the Russians and the Crimean War in the 1850s or, or so. Uh, ours not the reason why, ours but to do and die. Is that how we're supposed to approach life and its trials and difficulties. We don't ask for reasons. We don't ask for justification. We just obey. We're just 
soldiers in the battle and we're not privy to the causation, the factors that lie behind certain strategies and decisions. Ours is just to obey, just to do and die. Is that it? Well, this is another day. Chapter 2 and verse 1. There was a day when the sons of God came. Another day. Again, there was a day. A second day. We're not told how much time separated this one from the first one. And this time, Satan answers the Lord, verse 4, and says, Skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Satan is given permission. Uh, there's a boundary. You may not kill him. God sets a boundary. He says, Thus far and no further. But within this boundary, within this sphere, this side of the boundary, you may do as you will. You may do as you wish. You may touch him, but you may not kill him. Well, this raises lots of problems, lots of issues, lots of difficulties. It raises issues about health. People say, don't they? If you have your health, you have everything. People say that. It's not true, of course. It's, it's nonsense. You can have everything and not have your health. What kind, of, well, what kind of philosophy is that to somebody who's ill, to somebody who's sick, somebody who's got cancer, battling cancer? Have they lost everything? Can they never be happy? Can they never find contentment? Can they never find a sense of, of purpose and meaning in life? Is it all gone because they're sick? No, we don't believe that. Count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials, James says in chapter 1 and verse 2. And he'll go on to talk about Job in chapter 5 of the book of uh, James. Job experiences a sickness. It resembles what we have come to know of as, as um, AIDS, perhaps. Uh, the, the, the body wasting away, sores developing on your skin uh, and so on. Um, the book will describe some of the characteristics of his uh, sickness, his teeth seem to fall out, his, his breath seems to be putrid and so on. The expression skin and bones uh, comes from the book of Job. A wasting disease, uh, some have tried to give it a label elephantiasis perhaps. There's a vivid description in, in chapter 2 and verse 8. He took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. You know, that sore that, that you just want to scratch and you just can't stop scratching. I'll have you all scratching now in a second. <laughs> but, but you understand, this is, this, is a, this is a disease, but it's more than that. It's a life-threatening disease. This disease is threatening to take his, his life. Is sickness part of God's will for us? Is sickness part of God's plan for us? If you believe in the sovereignty of God, if you believe that nothing happens outside of God's decree, you know, everything happens because God decrees it to happen. Nothing happens outside of the decretive will of Almighty God. If you believe in that kind of sovereignty, then sickness is a part of that plan and purpose. No, nothing happens. Even, even the sickness, even disease, is part of God's plan. But it raises issues. The, the, pro the problem of pain, the problem of suffering. Either God lacks the power or he lacks the goodness. If God is sovereign, then he must lack the good. He's not good. Or either he's good, but he's not sovereign. That, that age-old dilemma. How, how can both be true and his own children be sick? 
Well, you can deny his power. That would be one philosophical, theological trajectory to go. You can deny God's power. Uh, Rabbi Kushner, for example, when bad things happen to good people. When bad things happen to good people. Oh, you may question the premise of the book that you know, no one is good. We're all, we're all sinners. We're all, uh, by nature, fallen sons of Adam. Uh, but let's give Rabbi Kushner the, 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 the benefit of that one. When bad things happen to good people, let's, let's change the title a little. When bad things happen well, to the Lord's people. When bad things happen to Christians. Christians get cancer. Christians get dementia. Christians lose limbs. God's people. The choicest of God's people. I have some vivid memories of friends of mine who loved the Lord, who served the Lord. They were preachers. I have vivid memories of a dear, dear, faithful preacher who, who loved the truth, who loved the Bible, who loved the doctrines of grace. I can still see him and with a Bible on his knees, but the Bible is upside down. And there are foul words coming out of his mouth. He had completely lost control of all reality. He was, he was so far gone. Couldn't even reach him anymore. And I remember sitting there praying with him as he's cursing me. This was a preacher of the gospel. And in my heart, I'm saying, Lord, why? Why this man, this good man, this godly man, this, this man who spent his entire life proclaiming the doctrines of grace and preaching the gospel, and you use so mightily. And now in this last season of his life, it's as though Satan has been given permission to do his worst. Why? Maybe God isn't as powerful as you think he is. So Rabbi Kushner says, in, when bad things happen to good people, God isn't, well, God isn't in control. Satan is in control. We live in a dualistic universe. And sometimes God is in control and sometimes, well, sometimes evil is in, is in control. Satan is in control. It's like the toss of a coin. Depends on where you are. Depends on which time frame you're in. Depends on which zip code you live in. And, and, and you can be in a zip code where sovereignty rules and then you can drive up a highway and turn a corner and then all of a sudden you're, you're in a black hole, a, a pocket. You're, you're in a wormhole, a, a fold in space and evil is in charge and, and evil is dominant. And that's the kind of universe that we live in. Well, that, that's one solution to the problem of pain. Another is to deny God's goodness. God is sovereign, but he's not necessarily good. At least not good in the way that you think he is good. Islam believes that. Islam believes in sovereignty, the will of Allah. Everything is the will of Allah, no matter what it is. It's the will of Allah. You can rape women and children and, 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 and behead people for no apparent reason. And it's the will of Allah. And God isn't good. Goodness is in some subcategory in the doctrine of God in Islam. Or you can deny pain itself. Uh, pain isn't real. Pain is a figment of your imagination. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Science. I love this little limerick. And you need to know that Deal is a is a place in in. Um, Kent, uh, near Ramsgate, uh, south east of England. And um, a Christian scientist from Deal once said, although it isn't real, when I sit on a pin and it pierces my skin, I dislike what I fancy I feel. You've got to think about it. 
but it's a, it's a beautiful little limerick on the nonsensical nature of, of pretending that pain isn't real. Because you certainly experience it, but you only fancy that you experience it when you sit on a pin. Well, for most of us, that's just complete nonsense, of course. Pain is all too real in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our churches, in the world around us. The world is full of hurt and sickness. And sickness, well, it dominates some people's lives. It dominates families and marriages. One thinks of a, a little child uh, suffering from cancer in a hospital. Texts that come, as they did to me last week, suggesting that perhaps this little child wouldn't live very much longer. And then in God's sovereign providence, there's a, a, a turning and better news and uh, an indication that perhaps through a fairly long and difficult trajectory, hope is emerging once again. Some of you have been there. Some of you know exactly what I mean. Is healing always God's will? Well, clearly not. Uh, Paul, for example, talks to Timothy. Uh, Timothy has stomach problems, maybe an ulcer, one of those grumbling ulcers. Maybe, uh, maybe he has uh, acid reflux before uh, days when over-the-counter medicines now and, and good medicines and they work and, and so on. And he says to Timothy, take a little wine for your, for your stomach's sake, because for medicinal uh, reasons you understand. Or Trophimus, he leaves behind in Ephesus uh, sick. This is the apostle. This is the apostle who has, who has powers of miracles, performing miracles. But he has to leave Trophimus uh, behind. So even the apostle wasn't able to heal everybody. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, we read that he wasn't even able to heal himself. He has this thorn in the flesh, whatever that was. And it might have been something to do with his eyesight because of... Uh, Something that he says in Galatians about, see in what large letters um, I have written to you. And he prays three times for this to be removed, and God doesn't remove it. So healing isn't uh, always part of God's will. God, God intends for some of us to walk in the paths of ill health, of the body, of, of the mind. Clearly that's a part of God's will for some of his um, people, as it was for Job. A terrible, wasting disease that threatened to take away his life. And we're introduced to Mrs. Job. We haven't heard from her before. And uh, we're introduced to um, Mrs. Job at the end of chapter 2. We read of Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery and with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. Well, Mrs. Job has not fared well uh, over the centuries by commentators on the book of Job. Augustine referred to her as uh, Diabolia Jutrix. You don't know, need to know any Latin to know that's not a compliment. Um, <laughs> she is the devil's advocate, Augustine said. Calvin. Calvin preached 150 nine sermons on the book of Job from 1554 uh, uh, to 1555 over a period of about 14 months. They weren't Sunday sermons, they were midweek sermons, lunchtime sermons, preached Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then occasionally on a following Wednesday in, in that sort of rotation. But it took about 14 months in, in the middle of the 16th century. And Calvin referred to Mrs. Job as Organum Satani. 
And again, you don't need to know any um, Latin. It's not a compliment. Um, Aquinas. Um, Satan spared Job's wife for this very purpose as his tool to employ. Well, I've always felt as though the commentators were overly um, strident in their comments on, on poor Mrs. Job. You know, she has lost ten children too. And perhaps, perhaps there's a milder interpretation here that she's saying to her husband, having drawn the conclusion that the reason why this suffering has come is because God has cursed them. And she doesn't want to see her husband suffering anymore. So curse God and, and die and get it over with um, quickly. Well, Job's response, of course, is he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Uh, foolish in the biblical sense here. The fool who says there is no God. In, in that sense. She's speaking from a worldview that is ungodly. She's speaking from uh, a, almost like an, an atheistic worldview. She's speaking like somebody who's denying the existence of, of, of God. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That's a staggering statement, isn't it, from Job? Shall we not Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil from God? You see Job's commitment here to, well, a doctrine of sovereignty, even in his sickness. Not just good things, but evil things too. Now, he's not saying God is the author of evil. Uh, Westminster Confession, for example, the 1689 Baptist Confession uh, of the 17th century is very, and they're only following me medieval theology in this, saying that God is not the author of evil, otherwise that would make God himself a sinner. What is the connection between God and evil? Well, he's in control. Nothing happens outside of his control, but things happen according to first causes and second causes. Things fall out by first and second causes. And, and uh, again, this is, wasn't just a re Reformation doctrine. It wasn't just a, a, a Puritan doctrine of the 17th century. This was, in fact, uh, uh, the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas in, in the medieval uh, era. Shall we, not, shall we accept good and shall we not accept evil? What is Job saying to us? Well, whatever the philosophical and theological answer to the question of the problem of pain may be, it is absolutely paramount that we live our lives in the absolute certainty that nothing is outside of God's ultimate control. Good days and bad days good things and bad things. What does Paul say in Romans 8, 28? All things, and this is something that we know, all things work together for good. That's where we want to rest. That's where we want to stay. Well, good afternoon. We're glad uh, that you're back. Actually, you might be watching it in the morning or in the evening. Regardless, we're uh, glad that you're here and tuning in. Now, some people, uh, the people watching the video last week were, were great, and they, re and they realized after they got to the end of this, oh yeah, we forgot all about the, uh, the teaching from uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, so this week, we've tried to put the teaching video, obviously before this point, and then the commentary and prayer uh, after that. So 
in terms of uh, th broader things going on with Safe Haven, as we've highlighted, uh, I think the only things left right now in the building are what's on the platform and the existing offices that we're transferring over. And there are certainly a lot of things up in the air. I know for the last several months, we've been talking about what might happen with the Gospel Lighthouse. And um, I don't want to get into too much detail right now, but I had a very disturbing uh, call earlier today, and they seem to be wanting to change all the terms of everything we agreed to. So, you know, I shared that uh, with the elders, and exactly what goes on from here, we will uh, let you know uh, very shortly in the congregational letter. So if you're not getting the weekly letters, for example, just send uh, an email to uh, info at safehavenworship.com or, or call the office, and we'd be glad to give you the regular updates. So before we get into our study tonight, let's open in prayer. Father, there are so many elements in our lives that are difficult and uncertain from a human perspective, and we would certainly choose a path and choose timings and choose certainty, yet through your providence, you know what is best for us. We choose one way, and you direct us in a different. We would like something to happen now, and you say there is a purpose in waiting. And even through difficulty, we wonder how possibly when things are so distressing in so many ways, how this could possibly be your will. Yet we know, Lord, even from this discussion through the book of Job, through horrendous suffering, that there is a testimony here that instructs us, guides us, and gives us a, a look behind the curtain, so to speak, behind your providence and your goodness. Help us to focus not so much on the difficulty of our times, but on the goodness of you and your promises. Let us see that from your word. We ask it in Christ we pray. Amen. So this is the second in our series, uh, and, it, and you might have noticed that things are starting off a little slowly, like all of last week. Uh, it was just dealing with chapter 1. Well, this week it's Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So it's not, not a lot of time, but I mentioned you should probably be reading about three chapters a week just to keep up, because it's really going to go fast as we get through some of the preliminary indications. As Dr. Thomas said, there's no clear time uh, indicated between what happened in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And hopefully you'll see through this the, the work of providence. And one of the most interesting questions, uh, referring to verse 3, is understanding trials without the reason revealed at the present time. Isn't this a lot of the elements of our lives? And so you have to consider, and there's the three main areas of considerations. Either God is not all-powerful or omnipotent. Secondly, uh, is God good or not good? And, th and three, is pain really a reality? Is it just something, oh, it's really not a big deal? And I think you'll find here with the answers that we'll go through with the Word of God, that Christianity uniquely deals with a God that, yes, is sovereign, a God that is good, and pain that is real. We're not trying to dismiss this at all, but bring us to the source of all comfort and assurance with God in this. So hopefully you can, as we go through some of the questions, see how this works out, and we'll go through uh, two parallel passages today. So the first one, uh, which is um, on page 10 of the study guide, the discussion questions, deals with, well, the work of providence. The question is, what is a proper way to understand pain and suffering in the providence of God? How should this understanding change the way we respond to pain and suffering? Well, one of the best ways to understand and how to respond is going to the Word. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the New Testament book of Romans. Romans is a, is a great section of Scripture um, that deals with a lot of the theological understandings of what we are going through today. And we want to look at Romans chapter 8, a very famous passage that uh, Dr. Thomas alludes just in passing, but I, I would like to flesh out some of the truths so we can see the person of God working and understand his providence through all of that. So if you're in Romans chapter 8, uh, the uh, superscription in my Bible is entitled Future Glory. We're going to read from verse 18 through 39. So follow along, verse 18 of Romans 8. For I consider that su the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, for those he for new he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those who he predestined he also called, and those he called he also justified, and those he justified he also glorified. What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hopefully with this you get a, a wonderful picture about the working of providence, but let's just pull through a few aspects of how the Apostle Paul brings this out. You know, so how do we how do we respond to pain and suffering really is the question that Dr. Thomas gives us here in lieu of providence. Well, in verse 18, there is the assured hope of future relief of pain. Pain is very difficult, obviously, and sometimes very severe, but it is only for a season. And part of what it means to be with the Lord, ultimately, is the relief of that pain. And verse 19 talks about the universal longing. We think often when we're going through difficulties, we're the only ones that are suffering. So not only is there the testimony of the church as a whole, in so many places in the world, facing persecution and the sword, etc., but even creation itself is not the way it should be. You know, the, the environmentalists understand this to a degree, but they don't understand the God of providence over this, and this will be alleviated one day. And then verse 23, uh, we just, on this past uh, Lord's Day, we celebrated Pentecost Sunday and this, the coming of the, of the Spirit, the first fruits of the assurance of that reward. This is why the Spirit is in us, to say, you know what, this world is not your home. This is not the end of the story. I am still in control. There is relief and hope after this. This is what the first fruits is talking about. Really, in verse 26 and 27, is talking about God is both that resource and help. You know, we often struggle with suffering because we struggle with suffering. If we just go to the one that is in control and plead out in, unto him and ask him for help, in one way or another, he will deal with us and help us. And in verse 28 is probably one of the most famous passages that uh, deals with sovereignty as well. So just leading up to that point, I just skipped through verse 24 and 25, talk about having faith and patience. And isn't this difficult? Because we often want, uh, we want suffering to be over right away. But part of having faith in God is trusting in him and 
and realize his timetable and ways aren't, aren't always ours, and that we wait with patience that he will respond. And so I just mentioned verse 26 and 27, going to him for help, and verse 28, talking about his providence, what God is doing and has promised to do. And so it's a beautiful picture. Actually, look at verse 33. You know, isn't this the same thing of what we're reading in Job? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Isn't this what Satan does? And we think about this. There's lots of places we, we get misunderstood, uh, we get uh, face persecution. And remember, through all of this, throughout the whole series, it's the, the spiritual realm, which we often don't see, and Satan himself bringing a charge against the saints. And there is the assurance here that if we are in Christ, our sins are forgiven. Even Satan himself cannot effectively bring that charge against us. And verse 35 reiterates that sovereignty. And verse 37 shows how it works itself out. Now let's quickly go to the second question. Second question in our, in our notes, how would you console someone in the midst of pain and suffering using the truth of God's sovereignty? And this is important. One of the reasons we're going through this study, not only is it to be a benefit to us, understanding God, understanding our role, but hopefully you will see this in a way for you to equip others. When you think of Job's friends, it's almost a master class and what not to do. And so... When we look about this, we uh, often some of the people that have gone through some of the most difficult suffering are the most equipped in order to minister to others, that we would get that. And I wrote a few things in my, my, uh, my notes that I think might be helpful with this. And I think you realize, and before I throw Job's friends under the bus that we're going to get to, at least they were there. At least they were there for for several days, actually, with Job, and they actually say, they said nothing. And I think that's the first step with that. You know, when someone is going through a difficulty, just polite words from a distance don't help. You know, I know there are physical restrictions on being with other people, but we can still regularly check in with somebody. And the more difficult the situation, the more that we should be checking in with them. And secondly, I, I, I mentioned in my notes here that we should ask, what's going on? Often, like, like you go to a doctor's office and you say, doctor, I'm in pain. He doesn't just say, here, I've got a packet of pills in my, in my pocket. Take this. This will take care of your pain. He wants to diagnose, he or she wants to diagnose, what is the source of that pain? Sometimes with suffering, it is self-caused through foolish choices. Sometimes there is sin that's unconfessed. Other times, it's um, not resolved other issues that... That, that are affecting us. And there's a lot of different reasons that we'll go through with Job. But even as we're seeking to console somebody, ask them what the problem is. Don't, don't assume that you know what it is. Ask them, okay, what specifically is troubling you? Because sometimes the answer to that, and certainly how to help with that, it can be different based on what we know. And then third, listen. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to testify, especially in position of pastoral leadership, is the one lesson that I struggle the most with. My wife will often remind me, stop interrupting me. Sorry, you know, guilty is charged. You know, after you have been there and asked the question, now it's time to listen until they've stopped talking. Before we instantly want to diagnose things, it's often how guys don't we want to deal with something. Oh, I think I know what you're saying, dear. So let me give you instantly the solution to solve this. Where often what counseling is really is asking the right questions and then listening. And often these things begin to start making sense in the person, but they only make sense if we keep our mouth shut and let them do the, the talking. And then I think what is very helpful is pray about this. Is acknowledge the difficulty in somebody's situation. And what is it? As an intercessor, going with them to God saying, Yes, Lord, I know such and such is suffering in such a way. Would you give me wisdom to help minister to, to this individual? Would you comfort them? Would you guide them? Would you strengthen them? This is part of the ministry. And only after you've done all those things, then I would suggest start working through some of the individual problems. It's not easy, and it's really a life through wisdom. And this is what Job is. It's wisdom literature. You might want to think... Um, 
that Job deals with the difficulty, Psalm deals with the cry unto the Lord, even sometimes communi- uh, in a community sense, and Proverbs is trying to give uh, simple, um, sometimes not so simple, uh, solutions and simple facts in order to how to deal with these situations. But it all fits together as wisdom literature in expressing three different ways, and they're excellent tool for Job, Psalms, and Proverbs to get an understanding of, of biblical wisdom. The third question, denying God's power, denying his goodness, or denying the existence of pain and suffering are offered as solutions to the problem of evil, obviously faulty solutions. Why are each of these options dangerous? I'll just work through this just briefly. If we deny God's power, then he is helpless in order to deal with us in our situation. If we deny God's goodness, um then why would we, you know, what's, what's more scary to deal with a, a powerful God that doesn't care? This is often, you know, the, the Greek concept uh, with the, the ancient gods that they were vindictive and cruel. Or even, which is probably one of the most condescending, denying the existence of pain. There's probably no worse way than to belittle somebody suffering than saying, oh, it's not that bad. Really? You know, I, I can't imagine through suffering uh, somebody going through that saying, oh, just, but isn't this when we often respond in these little short platitudes? Oh, you'll get over it. You're young. You'll have another baby. You'll heal. And other stupid things that sometimes come out of our mouths. It's, it's, it's acknowledging the reality of pain, and this is difficult, and helping us to understand the goodness of God and his sovereignty, and only Christianity acknowledges properly those three elements and has a a cogent answer for those things. And then finally, with our last question, we're going to go to the book of Job. Uh, Sorry, not Job, we are in Job. The book of James, James chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, just would you turn there, please. James is very helpful for dealing with wisdom, really, because it's, it's how to outwork some of the wisdom that's being talked about. And the question, how would you explain the fact that uh, though God is sovereign, he is not the author of sin? Uh, just in your notes, it might be helpful to write down passages like Isaiah 45 and 7. Uh, how God ordaining evil, but not the author of evil. This is very difficult to understand, but I think James deals with it um, in, in a helpful way. In, in our understanding uh, of the, the nature of suffering. So if you're in James chapter 1, let's start at verse 12 and go through to verse 18. And of course, it's blessed is the man, but we can refer to this as mankind, of course, humanity. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, which whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he uh, brought us both by the word of, uh, brought us through by the word of truth, that we should be kind, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I got tripped up on that because I was just thinking what we just read with Romans. Sometimes when you're reading the words, you almost start citing another passage as you're reading something different because we just looked at that concept of first fruits and how it brought us forth by the word of truth in that. But just what is James saying in how to and how to understand God's sovereignty and deal with trials? So, you know, there's one of a refraining here. Verse 2 talks about... Did I... Did I start at verse 12? I did start at verse 12. I meant to start at verse 2. So why don't I go back? (laughs) I was looking at my notes and I said, why do I have answers for verse 2? So uh, I'll read verse 2 through 11 because that's where I'm going to start. 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produced steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect when you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. For if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and, will, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with not, with not doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes, so it will be with the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So there's one here, and this is in many ways Job, because... You know, perhaps James was thinking of Job, and, and Job had so much and seems to have lost so much. So, you know, verse 2 talks about steadfastness or endurance for the redeemed. And that's difficult because God is, is calling us through perseverance to continue through the trials that we might continue to rely on him. And you wonder, what's this being made perfect and complete? The perfection is is one, it can also be translated, um, the, the genuineness of our faith. It's, isn't it true that we often sometimes mingle other things in our faith while we trust in our own resources and trust in our own ingenuity? And what happens when that is, that is put aside for a time being, perhaps? Then, then that faith is, is made perfect because it brings it back to the source of what faith should be. And it's made complete in terms of maturity. And it's when we persevere, we mature in our faith. And through it all this, it says, count it all joy. Because this is what mature faith is. That you can have, not in bitterness in terms of trials, but you would go to the source of comfort, which is God himself, that we may experience joy and not happiness. It's easy to have happiness when there are lots of good happenings, but... If we have faith through trials, it can result in biblical joy. Verse 4 talks about through these trials producing holiness, that we are conformed great, in a greater and greater degree to the person of Christ, who obviously persevered through faithfulness. And verse 5 talks about that we then seek God for wisdom. One of the worst things that we can do in a trial is somehow trying to figure out from our own mind or... Uh, which is one of the definitions of the fool in, in biblical literature and wisdom literature, that they go then get the counsel of the world or from an ungodly perspective to try and to figure things out. We need to go to the person who is sovereign over this in order that we might understand, obviously found in the Word of God. And then verse 6 talks about how our faith is strengthened as we persevere. And verse 9 and 10, which is something that we often don't like to do, that there is a sense of humility. You know, we, when we get knocked down to our knees, so to speak, we look up and pray to God as we are in that position of reverence. There's nothing worse than being self-confident and puffed up. You know, take heed lest you fall. We need to realize the, the, the source of, of, of sovereignty here. And verse 11 just shows plainly the the frailty of life with the flower here. We cannot presume upon health, jobs, opportunity, certainly uh, having friends or other people around that we love. Their life is fragile and frail. Much It's beautiful like a flower in many ways, but just as a flower can be um, the, the, lose its petals or, or be trampled down or be choked up with weeds, it is often the reality of life that that beauty can change very quickly. And verse 12 talks about how there is the focus, and it's reiterating back to what we looked in Romans, focus back on the blessing and the future reward. You can persevere through trials when you realize God is honored in that faithfulness and we're focusing on what is to come. And then second last, what uh, verse 13 talks about, and it's, it's very important, I want to read it once again, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself 
tempts no one. So what, what this is saying here is that God will often test in terms of um, refining, but he is not trying to encourage you to lose faith or to shortcut. And isn't this often what we want to do? We justify our actions. Well, God knows my heart, but I'm going to commit sin in some ways and short-circuit his righteousness. But it's actually persevering in the right way, especially when it's hard, that God is honored. And then finally in verse 17, it's actually, it ha- these trials help us recognize it is actually a good gift. It's probably a uh, the, the old uh, cliche, it's like Pandora's box. It's probably a gift that we would not uh, choose to open. But the thing is, when, when I look at the saints that have been able to persevere, they are some of the most equipped, they are some of the most faithful, they are some of the most patient and godly and humble and loving and holy. And why does why it happen this way? Because as they have been able to persevere through trials, they've shown who good... The, how God is good, and they encourage faithfulness with others. So hopefully you found these two um, passages helpful. Uh, things are going to start speeding up as we go through the book of Job. And uh, certainly now that it's on YouTube, it's a little easier that uh, you can rewatch the teaching series before with uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas. And if any questions you have, I- I'd love to either hear your questions or perspectives or even suggestions. This is you know, as much as I would love to have that interaction like we did usually on Wednesday night, we're, we're trying our best through this medium. So please keep those things coming. They, they're a delight to my day. And let's close our time now with prayer. Father, it is a difficult lesson that you have given us in your word in trying to deal with pain and suffering. Yet as we persevere, especially in a time like now where we look to you, the author and the finisher or perfecter of our faith, Would you strengthen us? Would we not bring a reproach upon your name, but not only show what it really means to have faith, but encourage others in that faith? Would we come to the end of this present trial and say, I have not forsaken you. I have not lost my faith. My my God is steadfast and he has proven himself faithful. Would that be our testimony? Would that be not only individually, but corporately, that we can say truly you are our God? This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.